The best way to see the true landscape of Cornwall and Devon is on foot. Britain is a walker's paradise and these two counties are packed with beautiful walks. Just another epic cove in Cornwall. Going to the places only your walking boots can take you. Oh, look at this. Hansel and Gretel style cottage. Just makes my heart sing. I'm with you. From the rugged rocks of Dartmoor to the wild beauty of the lizard. That is a joy. And en route, I'll be seeking out the county's most unforgettable views. This is thought to be the oldest surviving beacon in the British Isles. Pretty impressive. He didn't fall off! And meeting the people... It is an honour to be with the godmother of Cornish pasties. ..that make Cornwall and Devon so unique. So walk with me. It's going to be an adventure you'll never forget. On my Cornwall and Devon adventure this week, I'm exploring Devon's most famous waterway, the marvellously named River Dart. Britain has over 90 estuaries, and I love a good river walk. For my money, one of the best is right here in South Devon. The Dart Valley Trail is a 13-mile walk along the stretch of the river that links the two historic towns of Totnes and Dartmouth. It's a day-long ramble, but all the more rewarding for it. I'm starting my journey in Totnes, which is a small market town with a big history. It dates back to 907, making it one of the oldest boroughs in England. Here I stand and here I rest, and this good old town should be called Totnes. Them's are the words of Brutus. The legend goes that Brutus the Trojan christened the town after landing on Britain's shores. It was the River Dart that brought him here. The river made Totnes a wealthy town, and as you follow the walk up the high street, you can see its rich heritage. Today, Totnes is less famed for its history and more as a somewhat alternative and fiercely independent town. Ah, now conker shoes are a big part of the Totnes story. Been going since the 70s, handmade leather. Very cute little ones in there. These bespoke boots are built to last. Much loved for their bright colours by students and pop stars alike. It's a family affair run by Father Simon and daughter Katie. And it reminds me a bit of my mum's fashion business when I was growing up. Hello, hello. Hi, Simon. Hello. You must be Katie. Hello. Hi, guys. It is so lovely to be in here and the Singer sewing machine and the smell of leather. This is my childhood. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Basically, we make the shoes in this workshop behind the shop, which is on the high street. And you refurbish them as well. Yeah, so the way that they're put together means that they can be taken apart quite easily so that we can repair stitching, repair any bits of leather that might have worn away over time. So this pair, it's from possibly late 80s, yeah. um, which is kind of the classic look of Conker back in the day. So these have just come back for a brand new sole and then they're ready to go. What have you got on your machine there, Katie? What are you in the middle of doing? So I'm stitching the elastic into a pair of Chelsea boots at the moment. So this machine's about 50 years old. Yes, yes. It, it looks pretty similar <laughs> to the one that my mum had back in the day. But it still works like a dream. Look at that. Look, look, look. Look. You don't understand how hard it is to stitch leather and to be that neat and precise. I used to try and do this when I was a little girl and I'd make a complete mess of it. I'd just get the threads and the bobbins all tied up, jam up the machine. My mum would come and just, like, raise her eyebrows and shoo me away. <laughs> oh, so hard. And you are now the only person in the business who actually makes the shoes, so you're indispensable. Yeah, I'm pretty indispensable at the moment. <laughs> you better look after her, Simon. <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it. Leaving Totnes, the next leg of my walk takes me down river.
heading south through the boatyards and out into the Dart Valley Trail towards the Sharpham Estate. Britain has over 4,500 miles of rivers and canals. A very impressive walk. And this walk is testament to how our rivers are the lifeblood of the countryside. You can clearly make out Totnes where I started. And actually from there to here, it's about three miles. Even though it doesn't look it, you've got to follow the wonderful curves of the river. So you're proper walking by now, chaps. I'm walking through the Sharpham Estate. 550 acres of rolling countryside owned and managed by the Sharpham Trust, a charity concerned with the arts, conservation and rural regeneration. Their latest project, the Wild for People scheme, is letting nature reclaim more than 100 acres of this landscape. And that's why this bit here is particularly bushy. And you can see all this foliage. You can come and stay here for a wild retreat. I like the sound of that. It's a beautiful place to walk. Rivers like this are an important natural resource and a rich habitat for bird life. That is lovely. The path heads up towards Sharpham House. A beautiful grade one listed 18th century Palladian villa that overlooks the whole estate and the river that snakes around it. Julian, hello. Hello. Julian is the director of the trust. I've just been walking through your very lovely rewilding spot. Ah, yes, beautiful. You're getting there? We are. Basically, we want to make more space for nature so that wildlife can come back. If you look at the bigger picture, you have to be honest, we're failing. Nature is in decline, it has been for decades. Mm. So we're just trying to reverse that, really. And we've only been doing it a few months and we're already seeing a huge change. Uh, more insect life, more butterflies, bees, uh, and of course these things all interrelate. People come here and they come on retreats, don't they, for four yeah. or five days? We think by bringing people here, spending time in nature, it's not only good for their mental and physical well-being, but will, will also make them care for it and then go away and take action and so, tell other people. Julian, thank you so much. Pleasure. Uh, Thanks for coming. It was great talking to you and I'm going out there for more, more wildness and greenness. Good luck. Thank you. The estate is also home to a vineyard that's been at the heart of the British winemaking industry for almost 40 years. So while I'm here, it would be rude not to have a nose, especially today, the most important day of the season. So first day of harvest, Duncan. I hope I'm slipping in the right place. Duncan Schwab is the head winemaker here, and he's recruited me to help with the harvest. Be careful not to snip your fingers. Yeah, these are very sharp, aren't they? They certainly are. UK wine is a booming business, with around 700 vineyards and 130 wineries, producing an average of 5 million bottles of wine every year. So this is our early Pinot Noir. Uh, we make it into a red wine. Um, it's got amazing flavour on it. Try one of the grapes. Yeah. Nice and sweet. Oh, yeah. We can also make this as a sparkling wine. So the diversity of uh, having a, the Pinot Noir is if it's not quite such a good year as what we've got this year, and yeah. um, we can actually sort of ferment it um, uh, not on the skins and turn it into a sparkling wine. But uh, in the southwest down in Devon, um, we can actually grow quite a lot of still grape varieties. So we're actually make, making quite a lot of sort of red wines. Um, I, I take it that we're sort of almost like the Burgundy of uh, the UK now down in the southwest. So we've got a nice, cool climate, um, but it also it's sort of we get a long season. The 14 acres of vines here are planted on fertile floodplains that slope down to the river below. The location of this vineyard is also very important, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the, the decision to sort of um, plant on the south-facing slopes that we have here, so you get the reflected light up off the, uh, yes. the river onto the vineyards as well. 
but we've got very red Devon iron rich soil with incredible nutrients that sort of um, add to the flavour of our wines that we produce, unlike any other region in the UK, which we're very proud of. Such a lovely process. You don't use machinery, it's always by hand. All done by hand. I think we've done brilliantly. Now, probably best to take it back to the winery now. Sounds like a good idea to me. Does that mean I have to taste some wine now? Of course, yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's a shame. I know I've got another seven miles to cover, but please allow me this brief indulgence. So this is our Pinot Noir, which I've decanted, but it's sort of got a, a, a nice sort of fruity characteristic. It's been in French oak barrels, a little bit of maturation in there as well, some really nice colour in there as well, which is lovely. A little bit of tannin in there to sort of give it a little bit of grip in there as well. Oh, a bit of grip. I haven't heard that before, but it's definitely gripping. You'll have to come back next year, though, to try the one that you picked. OK, if you insist. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers. everyone. Good health. I'm back on the Dart Valley Trail, following the River Dart as it heads out to sea. What a magical spot. Destination, Dartmouth. I'm in South Devon, walking the Dart Valley Trail. There are secret creeks and dense woodlands all around. It's a 13-mile hike from Totnes to Dartmouth through a designated area of outstanding natural beauty along the alluring banks of the River Dart. The walk has brought me to Dittisham, a pearl of a Devon village just over halfway. And I'm heading for the quay, because now I need to cross the river and I've heard there's only one way. That should do it. Afternoon. How you doing? Good. The next leg of my walk is going to take me across the water and up to the Greenway Estate. People have been crossing this stretch of water from Didisham to Greenway Key for centuries, well, thousands of years. Cattle, cars, people. And then back in 1974, that was it, just humans. It's beautiful, isn't it? Thanks, Stuart. From the ferry boat, I'll be honest, it's a pretty steep climb. You'll need to be fit or take it slowly. But it's more than worth it. The walk just takes on a whole, a whole different atmosphere. As well as 300 acres of woodlands and gardens, there's a Georgian mansion. Oh, look at that! And it used to be the home of a very famous lady. I'll give you some clues. She is the best-selling novelist of all time. She's only been outsold by Shakespeare and the Bible. Her nickname is the Queen of Crime, and she's sold four billion books, four billion books globally. Agatha Christie bought this house, Greenway, in 1938 for £6,000. Greenway had for many years been hidden from the public. Welcome to Greenway. Thank you very much. But just over ten years ago, the National Trust opened the doors of Agatha's private residence for the very first time. I was just thinking, it seems like a steal, £6,000, even for 1938. Especially when she thought it was £16,000. She thought it was more. <laughs> and she'd have still bought it then. Of course she would. <laughs> yeah. Show me in. Come on in. I can't wait to see it. I'm very excited about seeing Agatha's house. Oh, what a room. 
and could so easily be, and probably is, the setting for so many of her novels where they solve the crime in the library. It could be. You feel as though it, it deserves a murder, don't you, really? Oh, it certainly does. Look at all the Agatha Christie books here. Yes, her personal library. So these are all her own books. Look at this. We've got Death Comes as the End. The mirror cracked from side to side, evil under the sun. Death on the Nile, murder on the Orient Express. Just goes on and on. She was so prolific. Tell me about Greenway. What did this place mean to Agatha Christie? Agatha was a Devon lass. I mean, she was born in Torquay. She spent her holidays here with her family. So Greenway was a really special place for her. It's where she could retreat and have her private time with her family and sort of engage with the local community. She was a governor of the local school, so the local school children would come up for ice cream in the garden. But it was a lovely place just to, just to be a wife and a mother and a grandmother. And this house inspired many of her books, didn't it? Indeed. I mean, the setting, I think it was more the, the whole setting of Greenway and, and the, the environment as well. And you've got Dead Man's Folly, the setting in the boathouse. Um, and then also you've got sort of the ABC murders and Five Little Pigs. So very much inspired by the locality. She had an unusual mind as well, didn't she? I mean, to come up with all those intricate plots and the murders and the, the very sinister plot lines. It was an incredible mind, but she wrote from a very informed place. So, you know, because she was a pharmacy assistant, she knew so much about poisons that it's, it's amazing that she could actually bring that to her plots and her murders as well. I didn't know that. Well, that's a that's very good skill set for, uh, for what she needed <laughs> then. And here we have the drawing room. The drawing room indeed. Oh. It's also where Agatha would proofread her latest plot to the family for the Christie for Christmas. And there's a lovely story about Max falling asleep in the chair as That's she her husband. family, Max Mallow and the archaeologist, her husband, and, and wake up just before the end and name who done it. How frustrating and annoying that must have been. It would have been, wouldn't it? Now, this is the most famous Agatha Christie picture, I would say. It is, yeah. Her. Lovely family shots here as well. As you and I have, we have pictures of our family and our pets at yeah. home, and Agatha was no different. What do you think the enduring appeal of Agatha Christie is? I think it's the brilliance. And you've got murder, you've got mystery, you've got intrigue, you've got passion. There's something in there for everyone. It really is very much a lady ahead of her time, I think. I'm leaving the fascinating story of Greenway behind me and getting back on the trail. There's about three and a half miles to go, I'd say. I'm getting a little bit out of puff walking through the wooded banks of the River Dart. Listen to the leaves rustling in the air. The last leg of my journey takes me to Kingsweir, where I'll take a ferry to Dartmouth, my final destination. Finally, we made it. It's a pretty epic walk, but here we are in lovely Dartmouth. It's a good place to end up. A really good place. It's a thriving town and the home of the only remaining naval college in the country. What an ending to a gorgeous walk. And much like Totnes, Dartmouth became the town that it is today thanks to this river. So, so relaxing and calming and just therapeutic. Today, the river brings a lot of tourists to Dartmouth, and it was recently voted the second best seaside town in the UK, just behind St Moore's in Cornwall. Mitch Tonks owns and runs two award-winning fish restaurants in the town, and he's made Dartmouth his home. What is the magic of Dartmouth? You've got the right word, magic, and I remember coming here as a boy on my first holidays. And I think now of Dartmouth as like an inland island. You know, once you're, he you're here, it's a long way out. But when you walk around these streets, there's all these kind of wonderful buildings, little pubs. I remember it being full of lots of independent restaurants and bars, which there still is. It is a pretty unique place. And when you look at all this, I mean, 
Rivers are the lifeblood of a community, really, aren't they? Well, everything in Dartmouth centres around the river. I mean, our visitors arrive by water. It's a huge attraction for boats. It's an ever-changing landscape here. Everybody that lives here sees the river as a, as a way of life. It's, uh, we're blessed. Do you think it would be fair, Mitch, to call this sort of the epicentre of fish? <laughs> well, you're very close to it. I mean, Dartmouth is a, uh, a shellfish port, so you've got the best crab and lobster in the world here. And just down the road in Brixham, you've got the best fish in the world. So. This is We're it. close. This is it. Of course I'm going to taste some of your fish and chips, but why do we love that dish so much in the UK? You what is it about the fish and chips? It's just something really amazing about it, right? And I always think that if you can sit uh, eating fish and chips with a view of the sea, you've got one of the best meals in the world. I, I don't think it's one of those things to take home. I think it's one of the things to eat out, and it is a true takeaway. And uh, it will always be our national dish, I'm sure. This beloved fried fish dish was introduced by Jewish immigrants and the first recorded fish and chip shop opened in London in 1860. Now, there are over 10,000 across the country. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I grab you anything else? Oh, I'll have a bit of ketchup, please. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I know I'm going to enjoy this. Right by the sea. Mm. The perfect fish and chip supper to end the perfect river walk. Mm. I'm in South Cornwall in smugglers' country. There are secret creeks and dense woodlands all around. Walking from the quaint village of Helford... Oh, look at this! Little Hansel and Gretel-style cottage. ..to Frenchman's Creek. It's just the joy of looking at trees. Look at that! River Helford! Super Let me have you! <laughs> Well, still stuck in the fridge, we have to ask the chilling question. Is time running out for Debbie and Kevin? We're back in just a few minutes with our second visit of the night to Coronation Street. <laughs>